Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you to Sir Peter for such a warm welcome. It's a great pleasure to be here speaking to all of you uh, in Gray's Inn at what I hope is the beginning for all of you of a brilliant career in the law. Um, you know, for my own self, I've had a rather erratic career in the law. Nobody expected to be appointed a judge at the age of 37, as I was. But I have to say that it has been an extraordinary privilege for me to be in the law, and I hope that you will all find working in the service of the law to be as fulfilling as I have. So I chose my topic this evening, is the rule of law incompatible with democracy? Because it is something I think that we've all been forced to think about over the last few years. I think you'll all remember that on the 4th of November 2016, the Daily Mail newspaper here in, the, in London published a front page with the headline, Enemies of the People. And under that headline were the photographs of the three judges of appeal, Lord Thomas, Sir Terence Etherton, and Lord Justice Sales, who had the day before handed down their judgment in the case that has come to be known as Miller One. For those of you who've been asleep for the last six years, the question in the case was whether, as a matter of UK constitutional law, the Crown, acting through the executive government of the day, is entitled to use its prerogative powers to give notice under Article 50 of the Treaty on the European Union to cease to be a member of the European Union. The judges in the Court of Appeal ruled unanimously that without the authority of Parliament, the Crown cannot, through the exercise of its prerogative powers, alter the domestic law of the UK and modify rights that had been acquired under the European Communities Act. Now, the Daily Mail front page story reported, amongst other things, that senior MPs, led by an ex-justice minister, said it was an outrage that an unholy alliance of judges and embittered remainers could thwart the wishes of 17.4 million Leave voters. They warned that Mrs May could be forced to hold an election in the following year if the courts did not back down. And continued, Leave voters said the judges had declared war on democracy. And it is this last statement that underpins my talk this evening. How do we conceive of the role of judges in a democracy? And is there indeed a conflict between the rule of law and democracy? The core argument that I will make is that a well-functioning democracy is premised on the rule of law. And where the rule of law is imperiled, democracy most likely will be too. The corollary I suggest also holds that where democracy is imperiled, the rule of law will also likely be under attack. I shall start, like any good person writing an essay, by defining my terms, the rule of law and democracy. And then I'm going to outline the relationship between the two, consider whether we should think differently about referendums, and finally, I shall consider the creeping and, I'm afraid, sometimes galloping threats to democracy around the world, that arise from populism on the one hand and the export of autocracy on the other. And I shall emphasize the important role that we as lawyers have in protecting both the rule of law and democracy. So starting with the definitions, the difficulty with this exercise is that both concepts have spawned a voluminous and at times overwhelming literature with many different strands. As the distinguished German constitutional court judge Dieter Grimm has observed, there is not the democracy and the rule of law. Instead, there are many versions of both. For the sake of brevity and clarity, I'm going to adopt one of each this evening, but I am going to say that it does, the answer to the question what the relationship between the two is does depend a bit on the definition that you give. So for this evening, in my view, the rule of law is best understood as containing three elements. The first relates to the structure of laws. They must be clear, prospective, public, and apply to everyone. These rules are not about what the content of law should be, but how the law should be. Laws that are clear, certain, publicly accessible, prospective, and consistent allow us all to know what the law is and enable us to arrange our lives on the basis of that knowledge. The second element of the rule of law also relates to a how question. How should laws be applied? The rule of law answer to this question is, 
they should be applied in fair processes by independent and competent courts. The New Zealand professor Jeremy Waldron has argued that the importance of this aspect of the rule of law is that it allows people a way of intervening on their own behalf in confrontations with power and enables reasoned argument in human affairs. So both the first and second elements of the rule of law are premised on our commitment to asserting and protecting the autonomy of human beings by ensuring that the law is clear and consistent so that we know what the law requires of us and by providing fair processes and independent courts to permit, it, permit us to approach courts for relief when we think that either our rights have been broken or we have a case against somebody. The third element of the rule of law is slightly different. It relates to the relationship of law to public power. The rule of law as a concept recognizes that law is central to the exercise of public power. It both enables and constrains it. Albert Venn Dicey, who I'm sure needs no introduction to you, famously coined this phrase, the rule of law, arguing that it meant, amongst other things, that no one should be punished save for breaches of law established in the ordinary legal manner before the ordinary courts of the land, and that every person, whatever their rank, is subject to the rule of law. The idea that government and its officials are subject to the law is therefore core to Dicey's conception of the rule of law. Sometimes when you read Dicey, you might think only about the importance of law as a constraint on power. But in fact, I think if we only see it as a constraint, we miss law's important role in enabling the exercise of power. Modern governments need to act, and they do so through law. So this third element of the rule of law, which talks about the relationship between law and public power, recognizes that law both enables and constrains public power. Now, others argue that there are other elements to the rule of law too. For example, Lord Bingham argued that the rule of law should also include the protection of human rights and respect for international law. There's no doubt that both these things are very important, but whether we need to assert that they belong within the rule of law is something we could debate. Joseph Raz, for example, has argued that if we make the rule of law too capacious, then it becomes the rule of good law and it almost covers everything. The result may mean that we focus more on substance and we lose sight of the structural and institutional aspects of the rule of law, something that I'll return to again in a moment. What should be noted, however, is that the rule of law I propose is polyvalent. It, it captures many different values, and sometimes those values will be in tension with one another. Some of the hardest questions lawyers face or when there are tensions between the different values and principles within the rule of law. Given that the rule of law cannot ever be fully realized to perfection, we recognize therefore that we have to balance the, t the tensions between these different factors and sometimes one of them will have to give way to the other. So the rule of law in a sense is a relative and variable achievement, not all or nothing. We can say it exists in good shape or repair insofar as a valued state of affairs exists, but not that it's ever been perfectly achieved. So there's the rule of law for you. Turning then to democracy, democracy is also hard to define. In the modern world, conceptions of democracy are largely based on the proposition that people are the source of political power, and that power relates to both how government should be constituted and how political power should be exercised. So one is about the structures of government, how we create our government, and the other is how that government should exercise the public power that it has in a democracy. Now, most conceptions of de democracy recognize that in modern complex societies, people need to elect representatives in regular free and fair elections to perform the tasks of government. Modern conceptions of democracy are founded on the need for representation, we cannot run a complex modern society where if all of us participate equally, we need to appoint people to do it for us. But there are exceptional circumstances when decisions are made by plebiscite or referendum. But even then, these always only relate to a small proportion of governance and policy making. There is no modern example of a democratic society that is not based on representation. 
and indeed even ancient Athens, which is considered to have been a direct democracy, also had a system of representation at its heart. So turning then to the relationship between democracy and the rule of law. As I've said, a key process of modern representative democracies is the election, and elections need to be governed by law. When elections will be held, for what constituencies, who can vote, where they can vote, how voting districts are drawn, these are all questions that have to be determined by law and then applied consistently with the rule of law. Again, as Dieter Grimm has said, since there's no democracy without elections and no election without a binding set of rules, democracy depends, at least in this respect, on the rule of law. But once representatives are elected, there need to be more laws that regulate how the institutions to which the representatives are elected work. Those rules govern how laws are made and changed. They're fundamentally constitutional rules, whether they're entrenched in a written constitution or in the conventions and practices of an unwritten constitution, as in the United Kingdom. They are laws, too, again, whether written or unwritten. A law that is without observing the rules that govern the making of, that is made without observing the rules of making legislation is not law at all. And once laws are made, they must be applied by government officials. And here again, the rule of law is necessary. Government officials must be bound by the laws that have been made by the people's representatives. And there needs to be independent institutions to ensure that the laws are followed. This is the foundation of judicial review. It is based on the principle that government, government officials must obey the, the law, a founding principle of the rule of law. So representative democracies need the law and the rule of law to provide for free and fair elections, to regulate the making and amending of laws by the people's representatives, and to ensure that government officials apply the laws that have been made by the people's representatives. If the law fails at any of these elements, then the project of democracy is imperiled. If elections are not regulated by law in a free and fair manner, then those who are apparently elected may not, in fact, be representatives of the people. If the representatives once enacted, elected decide to make laws in a manner inconsistent with the rules, then that too will threaten the democratic project. And if government officials do not apply the law properly, then the, it is the law that the representatives of the people made is not being applied. Of course, it's not only the rule of law that constrains government and its officials to act lawfully. One of the major determinants where the government and its officials act lawfully is the dominant political culture in a society. Where the political culture reinforces the rule of law, then it is likely that democracy and the rule of law will thrive. But where the dominant political culture does not do that, then there is likely to be contestation and turbulence, and democracy may be at risk. In this regard, it's important to note that in a democracy, those elected as representatives generally seek to remain in office. That is the logic and rationality of competitive democratic politics. It also follows from the logic of democratic government that those who are in power have, by virtue of their office, access to the legislative and financial resources of the state. Given these two factors, there is always a risk that those in power may be inclined to exploit the legislative and financial resources of the state to remain in power. Another risk in democracies is that majorities will seek to dominate minorities and perhaps even disenfranchise them. In the famous footnote in the American Supreme Court decision of Caroline Products, Justice Harlan Fisk Stone suggested that there be a role for heightened scrutiny to ensure court, by courts to ensure that where regulation might result in restrictions upon poli political process or might prejudice discrete and insular minorities, courts should uh, hold those kind of regulations closely to account. And we should not dismiss too easily the risk of legislation that will restrict the political process in favor of a ruling party or a dominant majority. Many democracies face the challenge of ensuring that free and fair elections continue to be held. One of the patterns of the last few decades across the world is the increasing prevalence of elections that for one reason or another are not perceived to be free and fair. In some cases, political parties or individual politicians 
are prohibited from participating. In others, there's no freedom of the media, or the media is biased, favoring some candidates and political parties over others. Or, again, the election administration may lack integrity. All these phenomena that are occurring, unfortunately, with increasing regu regularity, threaten democracy. And they can be protected to some extent, or protected against to some extent, by fundamental rights, particularly freedom of speech in the media, freedom of association, and the principle of non-discrimination. Thus, whether we opt for a thin conception of the rule of law, but recognize that it needs to be ac accompanied by a commitment to fundamental rights, or a thicker conception, like Lord Bingham's, that incorporates fundamental rights, it is clear that protecting democracy needs a commitment both to the rule of law and to the fundamental rights that ensure free and fair elections. Nevertheless, of course, at times there will be tension between those in the branches of government that are democratically elected and the independent branches of, gov of government, notably the courts, particularly where the latter find that the conduct of the former has been unlawful or infringed rights. This is an unavoidable tension in modern democracies. But the fact that it exists does not mean that the rule of law and democracy are under threat or cannot coexist. I think judges always need to be relatively robust and calm in the face of democratic contestation of judicial decisions, and lawyers need to be alert to protect courts where courts are inappropriately attacked, and I'll come back to that again in a moment. So well-functioning democracies require the rule of law to be in good working order, and they also require the protection of fundamental rights. In this sense, there's no conflict between democracy and the rule of law. They, together with the protection of fundamental rights, are mutually supportive. Perhaps we can think of them as a virtuous ecosystem, the one part of it flourishing where the others flourish. Now, I want to turn momentarily to the question of referendums, because all I've said so far relates to the system of representative democracy, and should we think differently when we're talking about referendums? Here I do not mean policy proposals initiated by the electorate, as in Switzerland or California. I mean those circumstances where policy questions are referred back to voters, as the Latin referre suggests, by the legislature or government. All of these processes, of course, are processes which enable popular votes on matters of public policy, but their origins and functions are different, and I only want to speak tonight about referendums in the proper sense of the word. It was, after all, a referendum about whether the UK should leave the European Union, and the decision of the Court of Appeal concerning how the outcome of that referendum should be implemented that informed the approach of the Daily Mail that I mentioned at the outset. Now, referendums are exceptional events in most democracies and are often considered to be an example of direct democracy rather than a form of representative democracy. But is it right to think about rep referenda as examples of direct democracy? To answer that question, we need to know what we mean by direct democracy. Perhaps the easiest definition is that direct democracy occurs when choices about public policy or government are put to the broad population and made by a majority of the people who participate in that process. Support for the principle of direct democracy draws on a strong intuition that when the majority of the people make a choice themselves, rather than through their representatives, that choice is deeply democratically legitimate. It is one of the reasons that referendums are often used for the adoption of constitutions and their amendment. Yet I think this intuition needs, we need to be careful about this intuition. First, we need to recognize, as I've said before, that can be no modern state that relies entirely on direct democracy. A referendum, therefore, is not an isolated event, separate from the ordinary institutions and daily business of democratic government. As I have defined it, it is held when a legislature decides to refer a question to the voters. The choice and timing of the question, its formulation, and the manner in which the referendum is conducted are all determined by representatives. As Stephen Tierney has observed, the agenda-setting protest that is the referendum is inextricably shaped by representatives. And second, we need to recognize that once a choice has been made, then that choice has to be implemented. And implemented by representatives. 
Referendum decisions are not self-executing. What further policy decisions will have to be made to implement a referendum choice will depend on the referendum question. Leah Trubelard has argued that rather than thinking about re referendums of moments of direct democracy separate from our representative democratic institutions, we should think of them as processes of representative democracy, processes that are fundamentally mediated by representatives. This makes it clear that referendums are not in some way outside of our ordinary democratic structures. They're embedded within the existing system of government. Yet that's not our ordinary understanding of refer referendums. We often think about them as a form of direct democracy. It is understandable and legitimate, of course, for, those to, for all of us to expect that a referendum outcome will be respected. But it's a different proposition to suggest that because of a referendum outcome, decisions of courts that may affect how that decision is implemented are necessarily illegitimate. As discussed above, all decisions hinge on legal rules and often on proper application of those legal rules. Suggesting that they should not do so simply because it has been a referendum decision is to undermine the rule of law. So again, I emphasize that I'm not saying we should not implement choices made in referendums, but what I am saying is that the implementation of those choices must be within the law. There can be no suggestion that it is permissible for a referendum choice to be implemented unlawfully, for that would be to imperil not only the rule of law, but democracy itself. It is for this reason that the article in the Daily Mail falls to be criticised. Courts must do their duty of upholding the law in cases brought to them, and may not shirk it, whatever criticism they may encounter. That is why we say that judges must perform their duties without fear, favor, or prejudice. I want to turn finally to talking about the problem of democratic decay and decline. All over the world, we've seen the rise of populist politics in both new and established democracies. In the last few years, the percentage of the world's people living in free democracies has fallen below has fallen from 46% to just 22%, to just 20% in 2022. About 38% of the world's population live in not free societies. And the balance, more than 50%, live in partly free societies. These figures are all drawn from Freedom House's Freedom in the World report, but they're echoed in other indices, such as the VDEM Democracy Report. There are arguably two key pathways that have led to democratic decline around the world. The first is characterized by the rise of populist politics, and the second by what we might call the export of authoritarianism. For those of us concerned about protecting democracy and the rule of law, it's important to know about the steps that, democracy, that take democracies onto these pathways. Cass Müller has defined populism as an ideology that considers society to be separated into two homogenous and antagonistic groups, the so-called pure people versus the corrupt elite, and which argues that politics should be an expression of the general will of the pure people. This is a narrow definition based on a particular, unfortunately very common, form of populism. Populist politicians of this ilk tend to emphasize the importance of popular sovereignty and prefer forms, of, prefer forms of direct democracy, such as referendums, over institutions of accountability, such as courts, and also over institutions of representative democracies, such as legislatures. Populist leaders tend to emphasize their direct link with the people, dismissing those who disagree with them as the corrupt elite or else as outsiders. In a sense, there are some echoes of this kind of populism in the Daily Mail article, which spoke about the unholy alliance between judges and remainers. Populist modes of politics create risks for democracy. Democratic government needs support from everyone, not only from those who voted for the government. Those who have won need to constrain themselves to act fair fairly and not target their opponents or skew the rules of the game in their own favor. Losers need to accept the electoral outcome and understand they will have another opportunity to win. Populist politicians may not behave in ways that recognize the legitimacy of de democratic processes either when they are winners or when they're losers. When they are winners, their narrative may suggest that they're the only legitimate leaders 
and accordingly may consider it appropriate to skew the mandate in their own favour so they can win further elections. They may seek to undermine independent accountability institutions such as courts and electoral commissions, and also tend to demonise opposition parties as enemies and seek to minimise the institutional role they play. When populist leaders lose, they dispute electoral outcomes quite often, which go against them, arguing perhaps that a corrupt elite has cheated. Both these forms of populist behavior threaten the democratic framework itself, and we need to be on our guard against them. The second pathway to democratic decline, the exporting autocracy model, sometimes overlaps with the populist model, but not always. It arises when external pressures are imposed upon a democracy to become more authoritarian. These pressures are often brought to bear by large autocratic states. And perhaps this pathway has been most sadly and best characterized over the last few years by events in Hong Kong. In speaking of Hong Kong, of course, I'm also thinking of the anniversary of Tiananmen Square, which we recognized on the 4th of June. Hong Kong, of course, has a very special constitutional arrangement arising from its history as a colony of Britain and its geography as part of China. The handover agreement between Britain and China in relation to Hong Kong sought to establish a constitutional model of one country, two systems, in which it was expected that the rule of law in good health in Hong Kong at the time of the handover in 1997 would continue to flourish. The basic law of Hong Kong was built upon the principles in the handover agreement and established Hong Kong as a special administrative region of China. The basic law promises the protection of fundamental rights, the independence of the judiciary, and a gradual path to democracy in a manner starkly different to the constitutional arrangements in mainland China. A key provision of the basic law confers the power of final interpretation of the basic law on the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress of China, which is not a judicial body, but a political one. The Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal also has jurisdiction to interpret the basic law, but is under an obligation to refer a question of interpretation to the Standing Committee if it concerns foreign affairs, defense, or other matters outside of the jurisdiction of Hong Kong, and is necessary for deciding the case before the Court of Final Appeal. Now, the Standing Committee has only exercised its powers on a few occasions, but those occasions have increasingly constituted a fundamental threat to the rule of law and the possibility of democracy in Hong Kong. Arguably, the current steep de decline began in 2014, when the Standing Committee announced that it would control the process of nomination of candidates for the election of Chief Executive of Hong Kong. This announcement sparked a two-month protest known as Occupy Central, or the Umbrella Movement, which sought unsuccessfully to have the decision reversed. Since then, the powers of the Standing Committee under the Basic Law have been invoked on several occasions. Perhaps most notably in November 2016, when the Standing Committee unilaterally interpreted Article 104 of the Basic Law, regulating the oaths must be taken by members of the Legislative Council, with the consequence that two leading pro-democracy populists who had been elected legislators were excluded from the Council. Following further protests in 2019, the Standing Committee unilaterally enacted the National Security Law for, for Hong Kong Special Administrative Re Region, bypassing the legislation processes and extending the jurisdiction of the mainland government to Hong Kong, including setting up the Office for the Safeguarding National Security and importing offences such as secession, subversion, terrorism, and collusion with foreign forces from the mainland, as well as providing for extradition of suspects to mainland courts for trial. The consequences of these events for the rule of law and democracy in Hong Kong are deeply worrying. It seems likely that the two systems, one country model of the handover agreement and the original basic law has been fundamentally damaged and may not survive. And I tell that story to remind us that the rule of law is never certainly entrenched. It is always possibly at risk. Lawyers need to understand what these pathways to the decline of democracy and the rule of law look like. For the legal profession has a particular responsibility in preventing decline in the rule of law. When the rule of law is under threat, it is very hard for judges to speak out to protect it. Judges need to remain outside the daily turbulence of politics, 
their judgments need to speak for themselves. It is for this reason that the legal profession, and I would add the legal academy, academic lawyers, have a professional duty to act to protect the rule of law. Of course, this does not mean that judges may not be criticized by practitioners or scholars, but they should be criticized on their merits after reading the judgment, not just on their outcome. There is an understandable tendency for people to judge judgments on outcome alone. Lawyers need to remember, however, that doing so is to discount the reasons that judges give for their de decisions. As practicing lawyers, it will be your job to seek to persuade judges of your arguments. You will spend your lives honing and refining your arguments to be the most cogent and persuasive they can be. Although not all legal questions have one right answer, many of them do, and even those that do not have a very limited range of permissible answers. Judges will spend a lot of time listening and reading your arguments and responding to them in writing with care. When we judge cases simply by their outcomes and not on the reasoning in the judgments, the toil of the legal practitioners in the case and the industry of the judges is disrespected. So read judgments carefully and thoughtfully, criticize where appropriate and with reasons. Protecting the rule of law requires us all to be attentive. In Hong Kong, many brave members of the legal profession have sought to resist the developments that I've described that are undermining the rule of law. And one cannot question the importance of that resistance. I'd like, in closing, to quote from a farewell sitting speech by one of the judges in Hong Kong, Justice Tang, who noted the importance not only of lawyers, but of all citizens in protecting the rule of law. We have a free pre press and free elections in Hong Kong, he said in 2015. Make your vo voice heard and your vote count. Believe me, the price of freedom is indeed eternal vigilance. Above all else, do not give up or underestimate your strength. If we as a community insist on the rule of law, it cannot be taken from us easily. Do not make it easy. Thank you. Wasn't that wonderful? Judge O'Regan has very kindly agreed to take questions for a few minutes. There are mobile microphones for those who aren't near them, each side of the hall. Uh, so fire away. We have a few minutes for this if there are questions. Please. No, I don't. I think that the, everywhere the rule of law is, has always got challenges. But I think one of the things that we have seen in South Africa, and I'm happy to spend a bit of time on this if people will be interested, uh, has been the important role that the courts have played through the process of what has loosely in South Africa come to be referred to as state capture. Um, which is the project of um, substantial patterns of corruption uh, within government. Um, the, the, the courts have, you know, across the legal system, and I think some of the other independent arms of government, such as the public protector, played a very strong role, uh, public protector until 2018, played a very strong role in seeking to protect the rule of law. And I, I think that's a, you know, it's, it's, it's been an extremely challenging environment in which to do that. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, there aren't moments when you could say to me, well, you think this, this is a problem or that's a problem. But the bottom line is the courts have really um, upheld the rule of law in the face of a very uh, kind of worrying uh, and, uh, situation. So I think that the, um, the, there is a, a, a kind of strong culture of judicial independence, and, and that hasn't always been easy. The courts have been subject to some pretty um, uh, very virulent attacks, not, not unlike uh, the Daily Mail article, uh, and I think the courts have, uh, have held the line and upheld the law appropriately. I join the previous questioner in thanking you for your talk. Um, 
you, towards the end of your lecture, you talked about the importance for legal practitioners, legal academics, to um, maintain the fight, if I can put it that way, the vigilance uh, to protect the rule of law. My question relates to the role of lawyers and legal advisors uh, to government in a country such as ours, where the good chap theory remains quite important to the constitution. And uh, the all party parliamentary group on, I think it's uh, constitution and something legal there, um, just came out with a report um, suggesting that Lords Chancellor and various justice ministers had, my words, derelicted their duties. I wonder if you have any, if, you, if there were a new justice minister from the House of Lords here tonight, how might you counsel such a lawyer to uh, uh, make sure that the rule of law is protected in this political constitution that we have? Well, I haven't read the report you're referring to, but just as a general principle, lawyers always owe their first duty to, to the law, to the courts, to uphold uh, the legal system. Uh, you, sometimes that duty can be a, a delicate balance between your duties to your client, but lawyer, lawyers may not forget their duty to the, to the legal system. And I do think that, uh, and, and this is a phenomenon we've seen in South Africa as well, uh, that not all lawyers remember that, and that there are times when lawyers actually uh, give advice, which I think is inconsistent with the principles of the rule of law. And I think that is um, ethically dubious, but it's also seriously damaging to the project of the rule of law. So I think every time you give advice, you need to, to, to remember what the project of the rule of law is about. And that does not, uh, you know, that at times involves working very carefully and thinking about what the relationship to your client's interests are but your priority is to uphold the rule of law. And I think that applies whether you're a practicing lawyer, frankly, it should, should apply to you as a matter of ethics, if you're not, even if you're not bound by the legal profession, by the simple uh, kind of moral commitment that one should have to the rule of law if one is uh, part of the legal system. Jim, thank you for your talk. It was really, really good. Um, I was just going to ask about, so there's a railway station in Hong Kong, which if you go inside it, it's under Chinese law. Um, and it means that people could potentially be sent to China. And there's examples of publishers who were just sent to China and then they're tried, if we can call it that, under Chinese law. Um, what could the court in Hong Kong do to counteract this? Because I'm unaware of what they can do. I, I think it, I mean, I just don't want to answer that because I'm not enough of an expert on Hong Kong law. It, obviously, the, the court faces uh, a significant challenge in circumstances where the standing committee has interpreted a provision of the basic law in a manner in which potentially the court of final appeal does not think is appropriate because it is clear in the basic law that the interpretation adopted by the standing committee takes precedence. And so it, it, it is, it, it's a challenge. And what the court has done in, in one of its judgments, which I think is very interesting, is taken the view that when the standing committee hands down an interpretation, that's a, in a legislative mode, it's not an adjudicative mode. So it's not to be dealt with, as it were, as part of the law, as part of a precedent binding upon it, but to be treated in a kind of a way as a legislative uh, a refinement of the basic law. Um, but it still leaves it still leaves the court, I think, um, with with you know difficult adjudication questions, which um, I, I really wouldn't want to hazard a guess as to how they would deal with. But but clearly, following what happens in the court of appeal uh, over the next few years is going to be important, particularly given the uh, enactment of the security legislation, which um, you know which is a cause for grave concern. Well, sorry. Question um, up here from uh, someone joining online. Uh, would repeal of the Human Rights Act uh, constitute a political attack on the rule of law, or is this something on which the rule of law is neutral? I've no doubt that the Human Rights Act is uh, it, it itself is an important piece of legislation protecting fundamental rights. Of course, however, it is entirely up to, you know, a system based on parliamentary sovereignty. It's, it's entirely up to the to Parliament to decide how, uh, you know, what legislation it wants to have in force, etc. So it doesn't necessarily mean that repealing the Human Rights Act is a breach of the rule of law. But I think that um, and we need to, to recognise that it's very important that parliamentary sovereignty allows Parliament to make these decisions. That's in the system uh, as it exists in the UK. I think that very often attacks on the rule of law um, are more, uh, are kind of more 
surreptitious in a kind of way. You need to watch for the ways in which law is applied, enforced, uh, and so on. It, I think a lot of attacks can come that way. Um, and it's, yes, so the bottom line is, I don't think it necessarily is. I think it's, personally, my own view is that it's to be deplored for other reasons. I think the Human Rights Act is a, a remarkably ingenious attempt at building a balance between parliamentary sovereignty and fundamental rights and that actually at the end of the day if one looks at declarations of incompatibility with the very narrow exception of prisoner voting this has not in fact produced an enormous amount of political contestation or difficulty between parliament and the courts it i think i'm on record i really believe it i think this is an extraordinarily clever piece of legislation that works well Hey, thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. Um, I just have a question whether within civil law jurisdictions of a codified constitution, do you think that a decline in democracy is more obvious to say the elites within codified constitutions, or do you think within uncodified and codified they're both equally as visible of decline in, in, in democracy? In a civil law jurisdiction, are they, I'm just repeating it so I'm sure I've got your question. In a civil law jurisdiction, are threats to democracy more obvious? Yeah, under, like, under areas which have codified constitutions. Than under an unwritten constitution. Well, I think that, I think it may look like that. Um, I, I think it's probably less to do with civil law than written and unwritten constitutions. There's no doubt that one of the advantages of written constitutions is we all know what the constitution is. We can all get out of our little copy of the constitution and we can say, here it says this. Now we might have a debate about what the meaning of the particular provision is, but it's there and it's clear. I think in a constitution which is effectively a, the amalgam of many centuries of conventions which are not written down in that clear way, we can have a, it's, it's, it's less clear what's going on. So I think, I definitely think that is one of the advantages of written constitutions. On the other hand, I am also sure that one of the most important things that pr protects a constitution, whether written or unwritten, is political culture. And that political culture is obvious whether you're in the space of a written or an unwritten constitution. You can see whether there is respect for the project of the respect for the constitution, its conventions and the rule of law uh, from people in, in authority or not, wherever you are. And those are often the greater threats um, than our debates about whether in fact technically we think this was a convention or is the Sewell Convention still a convention because it hasn't been you know, followed very often in the last while. That's a debate. You wouldn't have that debate in a written constitution. But threats to the rule of law, I think, come very much from political culture. And I think that's quite obvious to us, particularly those of us who are fortunate enough to live in places with freedom of speech and freedom of the media. I think this becomes much more difficult where you live in a society where the media makes it much less not possible to really understand what people in power are doing on a daily basis. Okay, to take the last it's been a wonderful exchange. Here, two more. I think I see you have yeah, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, uh, a Yeah, I think that's an echo. Obviously, not going to be the bar of this. Yeah, I think that's an echo. Uh, and the issue of fundamental basis. Uh, do you regard that uh, for uh, as a lot of the uh, individuals remain in the climate process as a man? Uh, do you regard that as a failure of climate rural uh, or democracy or political culture? Is it a challenge to this for uh, non -economy? Well, there's no doubt that it's very important that when people break the law that they're held to account. And that's one of the things that doesn't happen in places with the rule of law. So I think that one should take comfort in the fact that that, that is not what's happening here. People are being held to account for it. I think the next question is the question of political culture. Do we want to have a political culture in which we say that, um, that breaking the law is something that should result in removal from office? I will say that in South Africa, we do not have that as a strong political culture. And I do think that in the South African circumstance, that is one of the most worrying aspects, to go back to the very first question. I think it is a good sign when um, people in leadership believe that behaving, that obeying the law 
and looking like they've obeyed the law is, um, is something that matters uh, in political representatives. So that's a slightly reverse way of putting it. Judicially cautious. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. Uh, my question is slightly uh, more afield. You touched upon the rule of law and, and democracy, but my question is regarding uh, the monarchy uh, as an institution. I wondered how, what your thoughts were on how the monarchy, if at all, embodies or progresses the rule of law uh, within democracy. Well, I think I might just pass on that. I mean, I think... Yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 I do think this is an important question. I think... Thinking about our constitutional structures is the first part of being a citizen, and I think it's a really important question. What I wouldn't want to say is these are my views on it, because I think, you know, I, I, I really think this is something for you to think about and converse about. What I do think is important for the rule of law and democracy is that people who exercise public power are accountable to the people, and so any any system which does not hold people to account if they're exercising public power seems to me to be very problematic. But I think that the, this is, it, it's again, it's a, it's a question in a sense of democratic and political culture. And I think that's something that people should discuss over dinner. Thank you.